Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. I don't have, have the ability to see who's if folks are coming in. Um, I'm sure people might trickle in as I'm talking, but I'd like to just get started. So this is going to be a panel discussion on censorship and other issues facing libraries today. My name is Emily Butler. I am the Outreach and Open Educational Resources Librarian at the Springfield Technical Community College Library. Uh, a little housekeeping, if you have questions like logistical type questions, you can put those in the chat. If you have questions for our panelists, uh, please put those in the Q&A section and we'll take at least 15 minutes at the end for your questions. And we are joined here today by Becky Calzada and Martha Hickson. I'm hoping Dutavion Daniels will also be able to join us. I, I'm not sure, I, I'm gonna get started. So very briefly, oh wait, I'm so sorry. First I need to introduce our esteemed librarians. So Becky Calzada is the district library coordinator in Leander, Texas, a co-founding member of Texas hashtag freedom fighters, that's freedom with an R-E-A-D and is the 2023-2024 American Association of School Librarians president-elect. She was selected for the fourth ALA Policy Corp cohort and works as a member of the ALA, ALA Policy Corp proactive advocacy on book banning. She's the recipient of the 2021 ALA Robert B. Downs Intellectual Freedom Award, the 2022 AASL Intellectual Freedom Award, the 2022 Texas Library Association's Outstanding Services to Librarians Award, and was honored by People Magazine in their 2023 Women Changing the World portfolio. Martha Hickson has been a high school librarian since 2005 and is the New Jersey Library Association's 2023 Librarian of the Year. A graduate of Rutgers University's School of Communication and Information, her work has been featured in School Library Journal, Book List, Knowledge Quest, the American Library Association Intellectual Freedom Blog, and School Librarians Workshop. Her defense of intellectual freedom has been recognized with awards from the New Jersey Association School of School Librarians, the New Jersey Library Association, the American Association of School Librarians, and the National Council of Teachers of English. So I'm very, very excited to have you both here. I'm not as excited about why we're here. <laughs> to put it very, very simply and briefly, um, more and more we are seeing the removal of books from both libraries and schools. And more specifically, there have been unprecedented numbers of book bans in the last couple of years, with the overwhelming majority of censored materials being written by or about LGBTQIA plus individuals and people of color. In addition to book banning, there have been censorship laws passed, uh, protests at library events, individual librarians have been threatened, harassed, fired, and libraries have closed in some cases. So to provide one example, in July 2023, this past summer, uh, 28 schools in Texas eliminated their librarians' positions and converted libraries to behavioral centers. So this in the slides that you should have access to there's links to a very non-exhaustive list of of articles it's very hard to keep up with all of this news but i think these sources paint um a picture of the context of again why we're here and what we're talking about so if you have any time after the webinar i'd really encourage you to take a look at that i would also encourage you to take a look at the media and advocacy that becky and martha have been a part of um, because it's very inspiring and gives us you know a little bit of hope about what's going on the very last thing i want to mention before we get into asking panelists questions is some of the work that we've been doing at the stick library so last september we unveiled our periodic table of banned books installation so on the screen is kind of a digital replica of the installation each one of these book tiles is an eight and a half by 11 size piece of paper. So you can imagine it's a very large and eye catching display. It is a permanent installation. It's not something that we set up and we're going to break down. It's 
there to highlight these issues moving forward. It's also going to be an evolving display. Um, it is very much non-exhaustive because unfortunately thousands of books have been banned, but see, these are some of the most frequently banned and challenged books. Every one of these books in the display, if you're joining us from SDCC, if you're a student, faculty, or staff, these books are in our collection and we would love for you to read them. Um, we also have an accompanying website which gives more context on each book and censorship more generally. If you have questions about this project, you can email stccbanbooks at gmail.com. And if you're a librarian, we would welcome you to do something similar. All this is Creative Commons licensed work. And if you do that, you know, please let us know because I'd love to, to hear about it. So now I think will be the really interesting part where we actually get into our questions. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is if you could please tell our audience about how you've been personally affected by increasing attacks on library materials, programs, and jobs. Oh, well, hold on one moment. I'm so thrilled that <laughs> Detavion is here. Um, real quick, Detavion, I'm making you, or um, Kat, if you could make him co-host. So um, Detavion Daniels, who's just joined us, is the American Library Association's Banned Books Week Youth Honorary Chair for 2023 as well as the Partnership Director for Students Engaged in Advancing Texas, and the leader of Student Advocates for Speech Chapters at Trinity High School and Harmony Science Academy. And he is the youngest member of the National Coalition Against Censorship's Advisory Council. Thank you for being here, Detavion. Okay. Thank you for having me. I'm so sorry, I'm tuning in from like the Smithsonian because nation's capital we had an event today and we had the timing time zones got mixed up so so sorry i'm tuning in like this but no worries i think it speaks to um how busy you are with doing all this work and i'm just happy to have you here awesome um so my first question is if you could please tell us about um how you've been personally affected by increasing attacks on library materials programs and jobs and i was hoping we could start with becky Sure. Um, so one of the things I think about when I reflect back um, as we've gone through this journey, you know, with censorship, I think back um, during COVID, um, we actually, I feel sometimes that some of the censorship actions actually started in our district, um, just in terms of, you know, we were going through an adoption in our state and we were adopting element, or excuse me, language arts materials. And so our secondary schools were bringing in diverse literature um, and even though we went through these processes to include parents for feedback and all, once these materials were in place, we suddenly started having people come in and reading passages and stringing together pieces of passages. Um, at that time, it was about the, the language arts materials. It wasn't about libraries, but I can't tell you the stress that you feel when you hear things being read um, because I think the thing is, is that when things are taken out of context, that just brings about a lot of stress because you know there's gonna be questions about materials that you have either in your collections or those teachers had in their classrooms. So there's that stress piece. And um, then of course we went through the actual book challenges and it wasn't just like a, a one challenge here and there because you know we would have a book challenge every once in a while, but I mean, in one month we had like, you know, 15 challenges and we'd never seen anything like that. So there's the volume piece of that too. Then I also think another work impact would be um, public information requests. Uh, we've been getting some of those. And I say we, as in libraries, even in school districts in general, I think we're just getting more about that. And um, I don't know what's typical, but, but it seems to me that when somebody wants to know all of the books you've purchased in the last three years, um, like that takes a lot, of, that's a time intensive work. And so the workload to get that, figure that out. And of course, you know, we have, um, I say laws, but, you know, procedures in our state, you know, if it takes a certain amount of time, people have to pay and that sort of thing too. Um, but not only do I think through the impact of the work, I think about the personal impact in terms of as a library coordinator, that sort of work takes me away 
from supporting my librarians. I have 12 new librarians this year, and that's a lot for me because we have 40, 40 librarians and they have, you know, there's needs to support them in terms of, you know, mentoring. And of course, then there's just the, the programming sort of piece that I help them with or the work that I do with curriculum coordinators. This kind of work takes me away from that stuff. Um, so I know it's intentional, um, but it also is stressful and, and um, that does take a toll. Thank you, Becky. I think we talk a lot about the statistics, and so I just really wanted to hear some some personal stories as well. So, Martha, would you mind sharing how this has been affected, how you've been affected by these issues? I do not mind sharing. Um, I'll probably take a slightly different approach than Becky and get very personal. <laughs> um, my Intense involvement with this issue began on September 28th, 2021, a date that has burned in my memory. On that day, while I was eating my lunch, my principal came to my office, something that almost never happens, uh, <laughs> to tell me that he had heard a rumor that there was going to be um, a complaint about a book at that evening's board meeting, which is not the way those complaints should happen. Uh, I asked him which book he told me genderqueer. So as he stood in my office, I pulled up for him the excellent reviews of genderqueer, which is what prompted uh, my purchase of it. I gave him copies of all of the um, uh, documentation around purchasing uh, library books, our selection criteria, uh, the reconsideration policy, and the request for materials reconsideration form, and reviewed with him how this process should work and he left my office and I was, I don't know, slightly optimistic that he understood and things would go properly. But out of curiosity, I'm an intensely curious person. I tuned into the board meeting via live stream that night. And as it all played out, uh, there was a group of people, I would say about 30 of them there that night. And when uh, their representatives rose to speak, they decided to... Uh, complain about two books, not just one, Gender Queer uh, and Lawn Boy by Jonathan Embison. They read passages from Lawn Boy, distributed images from Gender Queer. And if you're at all familiar with what's been going on over the last two years, you can probably point exactly to the page they distributed from Gender Queer. Uh, then they went on to complain about Banned Books Week. This event happened during Banned Books Week and the fact that the library was celebrating it as we had done every previous uh, for the last 16 years without any incident or complaint whatsoever. And then last but not least, they went on to complain about yours truly, <laughs> labeling me by name a pornographer, pedophile, and groomer of children. Now, as I said, I was watching this via live stream, and uh, this is probably what my face looked like. I was, I was just shocked. Thank God my husband was with me, but it went from shock to then intense physical symptoms, um, my heart racing, sweating, my stomach churning. Um, fast forward, as it played out over the next week, they uh, eventually submitted reconsideration requests for five books, in addition to Gender Queer and Lawn Boy, uh, All Boys Aren't Blue, Fun Home, and This Book is Gay. And again, if you're keeping score, all of those have one thing in common. Uh, LGBTQ plus characters and themes. Um, this was also followed by uh, nuisance vandalism in the in the library, where students who were uh, aligned with these parents were coming in and intentionally seeking out uh, books having to do with gender identity and the LGBTQ plus experience. Uh, they were throwing them on the floor. They were um, misshelving them so they couldn't be found or turning them backwards on the shelf so that the spine uh, was no longer uh, face out. I started getting hate mail um, and attacks on social media. And by the way, those social media attacks continue to this day. Some of my colleagues um, began shunning me. That shunning continues to this day. Um, my administration, to say they were not supportive is an understatement. They were actively accusatory and antagonistic. They offered me no support uh, whatsoever. Uh, and all of this culminated about a month later um, with a breakdown. I had a breakdown at work. Um, I was having trouble breathing. I was crying <laughs> incessantly. I wasn't able, um, you can see I'm rather talkative. <laughs> I was unable to speak. They had to call my husband uh, to pick me up. He took me to my doctor um, who was 
incredibly concerned. Uh, she wrote me out of work for several weeks, uh, referred me to a therapist, uh, put me on anti-anxiety medication. But when I returned to work about a month later, I returned with a vengeance. And I have since then been almost full-time a crusader for the right to read. And P.S., five months after this started, in January of 2022, the board voted to retain all five books. Thank you for sharing. I have followed your story and the articles that have been written about it. And I... I it's just horrible and I, it would be very understandable for you to leave the profession or decide not to publicly speak about any of this i just i really i don't know i appreciate your willingness to to talk about it because i know you're not the only one out there this is happening to. um and like i said i really wanted to highlight the human aspect of this issue and yeah you know, um, emily yeah. can i add to i think when martha speaks I mean, anybody that speaks out becomes a target. The level of how you're targeted may be different. I mean, I, I get a jab here and there on social media. I, I also recognize I'm not in the trench. Like I'm not in a library, but I do work with my librarians closely. Um, but people take things that you do when you speak out and they twist it around and misrepresent the work you're doing. Um, so yeah, it, it, there, it just definitely takes a toll after a while. So there has to be a lot of self-care for yourself because if this is, it's courageous work and it's the right work, but you know, again, you know, when you stand up, you become a target. Exactly. Yeah. Did Tavion, are you able to, to, um, answer this question about how you've been personally affected? I mean, obviously this is a really, really important issue for you. So I'd be really curious how you got started in this work, how you've been affected by, by it on a personal level. Yeah. So I'll start with how I got started with um, working, you know, for intellectual freedom and, you know, kids rights to read. Um, it actually started because my first school where I started my first SAS chapter didn't have a library, like no library at all. Um, and when we pro a pro like we brought the subject to our administrator and he was basically steadfast in his mindset you know no not right now this that, and another um so that's led me to start SAS which was student advocacy speech and I started doing trainings this summer um with the National Coalition Against Censorship and with that knowledge I went back to school the next year started out fresh in August and we were we had a mission um we were going to get a library and we were going to get the books that we wanted to read. Um, so with what I gained from NCAC, we started um, petitions, we did um, letter writing, we did silent protests in the hallways. And uh, eventually it got to the point where um, we were basically being shunned by our administration for wanting, you know, and basically collectively organizing as a as one you know the student body and they were upset about that so we just kept putting pressure on them they didn't budge so we went to our administration no um, our administration's administration which was district and head office we took them our petitions we took them our uh, our failed attempts at reasoning with the um, administrator and we ended up getting a new principal and a new library and everything the whole nine yards um because the district felt like this is a a title one school this is a school like this had this school in particular has the highest concentration of minorities in our charter district so it was like the district was very upset about the situation so they ended up you know we got a whole new administration team a new library um and from that point on i just like progressively got more and more involved in the band book scene and the work and I started learning more about it and started reading the books that they were trying to ban. And that's really an eye opener because you see what they're trying to ban. It Nothing about it is wrong. They're trying to ban people's existence. They're trying to ban lives. They're trying to ban personalities and identities. And that's an issue. And this is so supposedly land of the free, but we're trying to tell people that they're not you know, they don't have the right to exist. And that just didn't sit right with me. And that's how I, you know, kept getting involved in this work. And 
eventually got pushed into the legislative aspect of it with policy making. Thank you for sharing. I feel like that's a, a common trajectory. You start local and then you move out from there. And it's nice. I'll take any success story I can get. An individual school getting a library is a, is a huge success, uh, if you ask me. So um, I'm also wondering what it is you think about, what it, do you think it is about libraries, sorry, that makes them such a target for this criticism? And I was thinking we could start with Martha. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think it has to do with um, the nature of librarianship. I mean, our role, our job is to create expansive collections with many ideas from across the spectrum of experiences and beliefs. And so, of course, not everybody is going to agree with everything that's in your library. But, you know, part of it is you don't have to read the books in a library. It's not required reading and it's all self-selection. Um, and somehow that idea has been lost. I think part of it is that many of the people who are coming after us are not library users. <laughs> uh, the other thing about it is um, I think that libraries, a female dominated profession, if I may, um, are a somewhat easy target, uh, especially in schools, often because uh, in most schools, as, as Datavian's experience just demonstrated, uh, if there's a library and uh, if there's a li professional librarian in that library, there's just one of us. We are an island and we are a mysterious island because other people in the school don't really know what we do. They don't get it. And unlike uh, public libraries, um, you know, which they, they exist and, and their employees are all focused on this idea of intellectual freedom. On our mysterious island in the school, we may be the sole being in the school or in the district that has an understanding of the importance of intellectual freedom. So that makes it especially difficult for us as school librarians to be the sole supporter of this idea. And sadly, it's leading, I think, in some uh, situations to sort of self uh, driven soft censorship. The other thing that's going on here too is the bulk of the, these banning attempts obviously are books written for young people and the book banners use some very specific language when they're talking about this. They appeal to the safety of children and they refer to anyone under age, age 18 as a child. Now we just had one of a, a child speaking to us from Washington DC to call our adolescents and the bulk of these books are for adolescents to call those young adults, those teenagers, um, children is an intentional misrepresentation. It infantilizes them uh, as if they're kindergartners and it's, uh, compels a sense of outrage in the listener. You know, we've got to protect the children. I think there's also a lack of respect for the professional credential um, that we hold, what it takes to create and maintain a library. People think because they've been in a library, if they've been in a library, that they know how a library works. And our teacher colleagues go through the same thing. People think since they've gone to school, they know how to teach. Well, it ain't true. And then there's this overall social and political climate, um, a lot of which uh, evolved from the results of the 2020 elections uh, and the um, concurrent protests over masks and vaccines. It's all just sort of morphed in this big toxic blob <laughs> into this free floating outrage that currently is sitting on top of libraries. And that brings me to the point of this is really not about books. <laughs> um, books are just the tool, the means to an end to achieve um, bigger political goals. And because books are such a low hanging fruit, that's why they're being used. Those are all very good points. Some of which have really never occurred to me. So I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we're this event is hosted by a community college. There's a reason we are talking a lot about K through 12 schools. It's where a lot of this stuff is happening as well as public libraries, but it is that use of protecting the children that allows this discourse to happen. And that's why it tends to be so focused on K through 12 schools, young adult books, picture books, that sort of thing. But it's such a good point that, you know, a teenager is not a child and 
we could say, you know, regardless, children have a right to read, teenagers have a right to read is the flip side of that argument. But uh, Becky, would you mind talking about that? Why you think libraries are such a target? So definitely agree with all that Martha shared. I think the thing about libraries is that, um, and even just, let's just go even deeper with public schools, you know, these institutions are great equalizers in our society. So when I think of me personally in my life, um, my parents only had up to an eighth grade education. They were not born in this country. They emigrated here, got naturalized, you know, became citizens, et cetera, got married, whatever, right? But for them, they understood the importance that literacy to, could be in a life. And so they would take me to the public library. And we read all the time. We weren't a poor family, but we had modest means. I, we did not own a lot of books, but when they could, they, they just understood that taking me to the library, taking us as kids to the library opened up, you know, opportunities for us because, you know, in a library, there's information, there's, you know, books to read for pleasure. You, you learn and you, your, your, your brain grows, your knowledge expands, you know, it also inspires a lot of curiosity. And then I think about just all the information that's inside of books, right? So it's life changing. And, you know, what we also know is that, you know, for many, so for we know that, that there's a lot of research around literacy, that the more you read, the smarter you get, that, you know, the greater, stronger scores, you know, you have, et cetera, right? But one of the great things about libraries, even beyond that, is that libraries, school, you know, public libraries, college libraries, I mean, they provide access opportunities for anybody that chooses to use their resources, right? And like Martha said, you know, libraries are spaces of voluntary inquiry. So you choose to go into this space, you choose to check out a book. Nobody forces you to check out things. Um, there, there are resources, print and digital. There could even be technology. There could be access to equipment like a 3D printer like we have in our schools, you know, for our students, you know, not everybody has access to those kinds of things. And so libraries provide those spaces, those resources for people, and they're, they can be life changers for learners, no matter what the age. But books right now are being used as, are being weaponized, you know, as Martha said, because they, if you, if you pay attention, um, they keep talking about the same books. Um, they don't talk about um, how books can be windows, mirrors, and sliding gap glass doors for readers. And I tell the story for me, the first book that I read that I saw myself as, as a Hispanic child, I was in my 30s when I read that book, you know. And I mean, so I was already a grown woman. I had, you know, kids. And, you know, why did it take that long for me to see myself in a book, you know, called Too Many Tamales, right? So there's just all this diverse publishing that's happening that, that highlights um, the lives of people of color um, and that's not historical in a historical context, um, or there's maybe um, topics around activism or sexual health. I mean, all of these topics are being targeted. Um, so yes, some of it's about fiction, but some of it's just about information access. I mean, we've seen even databases, you know, be targeted. Um, when we were going through our and I say we, Texas, was going through its early stages of book challenges. You know, Representative Krauss, you know, sent a list of 850 books. And on those books, he had books like Stamped from the Beginning. Um, I mean, he had, they were all kinds of books. And it, I think people are, are afraid of information. I think, I also think there's a recognition that, that when readers read um, these great works of literature, whether it's, you know, a, a, a something from the canon or just something that's brand new, that they they are worried about the changes that's going to make to the reader. But what we know is that books can save readers' lives. I think about someone that reads the book Speak um, by Laurie Hall Sanderson, or maybe somebody reads the book um, Know My Name by Chanel Miller. Like that could change a life for somebody that's going off to college or somebody that's experienced a sexual assault. And so we have to think about those things. And, and are they difficult to read? Yes, they are. But for, the, for that book, for one person, could be life-changing. And I, and I think the last thing I want to say, too, is that we just have to always remember that um, 
we have a few of a, a vocal minority of parents or maybe a parent that are making decisions that impact many families. And so every family has the right to choose for their child, but they shouldn't choose for all children. And so I think that's the thing that we have to keep in mind too. I think that was an answer to the question of why libraries and a little bit of the answer to the question of why now, not that this is new, but there is, there are some new trends and I have questions about that that we'll get into about this moment that we're, that we're in. So I appreciate that. Um, Detavion, what do you think about why libraries are such a target? I think libraries are such a target. I honestly, everything that Martha and Becky said, like it personifies this exactly. But especially right now, we're in such a politically polarized time that, you know, certain sides of parties have to go for what they can get. And, you know, I think Martha said this, it's the low hanging fruit. Books are the low hanging fruit. Um, and it's a very underrepresented community. You know, authors are, it's a very niche population. Um, and it's very niche in the sense that there are very niche groups of different, you know, identities and backgrounds writing certain books that are, you know, being challenged. And it's all to control the narrative. And it's all towards those bigger political goals. Like in Texas, right now we're seeing vouchers and the attack on public school systems as a whole. And that just, like, we've seen the governor go around the state and he's saying, like, we have to reclaim parental rights. We can't, you know, we have to control the rights of and the lives of our young people. And he's using that momentum to not only push his vouchers bill, but he's using the same language. We're seeing everyone use the same language of parental rights, protecting their young people. But in at the same day, what they what they're actually doing is harming young people um, in a very profound way. Books allow us to humanize um, ourselves and be able to empathize with others and, you know, our surroundings and our community. You know, this is one of, this is the, I would say the most diverse nation on earth. Um, and when we're not allowed to experience things outside of our own identities and personalities, then we, we just become more politically polarized and we become more niche and, you know, stiff to our ideas and things that are instilled in us in the in the home and it's it's just all a control effort you know an effort to control the narrative an effort to control elections an effort to control the population to control the free people of this nation and it's just really sad because we've seen it go so far and i also want to slightly touch on the why now because it's it's simply censorship historically has come in waves last biggest wave we saw like in the world was the Nazi, like Nazi era. You know, I was actually reading a book this morning. Well, like at 12 in the morning, because I was on a train um, called Existentialism is Humanism by John Paul Satir. And the first page on the introduction, it talks about, you know, how there was this coalition of authors in France and they were fighting for, you know, freedom and it wasn't a Nazi controlled area at the time so they would just publish and publish and publish while they still could and why they still had their freedom of expression and thought because you know if you control the narrative that's being pushed and you control everything all the factors and facets you control the people so I, I feel like that's the main goal and the issue at hand. You know, Emily, just to put a button on this, Detavian used a word early in his response that triggered an idea for me. He used the word niche several times. And when I think of niche, that made me think of uh, the liberal elite. You know how there's this aversion uh, on the right to liberal elite, which is coded language for college educated. Well, what is more symbolic of a college education or in their words, liberal elite than a book? That is why libraries are a target. That was very succinctly put. So we've touched on this a little bit. Some of you have already mentioned this, that survey data really continues to demonstrate over and over that actually a strong majority of people view libraries positively and view librarians positively. It's really a small minority of people who are driving this conversation. So my question for you all is how can people who support libraries get more involved, students who want access, parents who want their children to have access? I would love if Detavion could start 
us off with that part of the conversation. Yeah. So I just have to say, like with the whole statistics fact, you know, that's really the issue here. And when you actually see the numbers, you act, it actually personifies and contextualizes itself. Like people in the nation don't want this. And, you know, it's being backed by these big, large, you know, packs and groups and political parties simply because, you know, who else is going to do it and who else is going to, you know, inflict the harm. But I'm going to use a statistic from Penn here. It's the 60-12, you know, is it 60-12 or 60-11? It's 60-12. 60 percent of book bans in 2021 and 2022 were caused by 12 percent of people. 60 percent of book bans in the entire nation. Now, that is crazy. Now, just think about what that number is now. We, we were seeing groups um, prepare, you know, their troopers, their soldiers, their groundmen with, you know, cars and basically with no context at all, going into school board meetings, reading the most explicit piece of material out of a memoir that talks about sexual assault. We saw this on the Senate Judiciary like hearing with Cameron, who I'm like, who's over there. <laughs> and we, we saw this, you know, we saw this happen at our nation's capital, you know, where our our nation is supposed to be embodied in freedom and protecting our rights, you know, and it's it's really crazy. Um, can you ask the second part of your question again? I kind of went on a tangent. Sorry. No, that's OK. I mean, I think you're well posed to answer it. It's, you know, for example, students who want access to these books, parents who want their children to have access, like how can they get involved? Like what specifically can they do? Okay, so to kind of think. Okay, so I say activism is whatever, you know, makes your voice feel heard. Um, so in any way that you feel you're helping the movement um, or having your voice heard, then do it. But some actionable items I would say is, you know, supporting the grassroots organizations who are fighting this because a lot of the time with the larger organizations it's really like point driven and idea driven and if something along the way that comes up falls out of line with that you know you're going to get left out and it's it's just horrible because all of the hard work goes to nothing but supporting local grassroots organizations getting involved with organizations staying up to date you know um, using trustable sources, trustworthy sources, and don't just use one source, even if it's trustworthy, use multiple sources, you know, even if it's, you know, the opposite side or the opposite idea, you know, you still want to, you want to learn their argument and see how you can use it against them. Um, because a lot of the time they're, they're just mindless puppets, you know, typing a, away at whatever they, <laughs> whatever, um, someone who's higher or above them tells them to and you know it's it's a basically it's a farmer and the sheep kind of thing um but it's good to be the big bad wolf sometimes it's good to you know use their material against them use their falsified statistics against them use reputable sources use multiple sources and just be steadfast in your advocacy no matter what it may look like because in all truth and all honesty um, it doesn't matter like your background or who you are or how the fight has affected you or how the movement has affected you. But so long as you're active in your own way, then that's that's all that matters, really. Yeah, I would echo keeping up with what's going on, which is hard because there's a lot happening. One of the sources I put in the slides is a bill tracker that I find useful because there's just a lot going on all over the country with this issue. Um, so it can be really overwhelming, but everything makes a difference. So Martha, would you mind talking about this? Yeah, I'll start off with keeping track of what's going on. The two tools I use every week are the censorship roundup from Book Riot, um, which is Kelly Jensen is a hero. Uh, and if you read nothing else in a week, read that. Uh, and the ALA Office uh, for Intellectual Freedom also has uh, a summary that they uh, issue on Fridays. And if you are a librarian listening to this, you can set up uh, a Google alert for news about censorship. You can set up uh, search alerts in your databases. I have one that comes to me from ProQuest every Monday morning. So I'm not out there every day searching. I let my little robot do it for me. 
Um, but just to step back to the bigger picture, the first thing you need is the right mindset. And the mindset cannot be, oh, well, somebody's going to take care of this because that ain't happening. If you're concerned about this, you have to take care of it. Uh, and somebody, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they used a great analogy. Um, think about this like a fire department. You need to create the volunteer fire department before the house is on fire. And so start working now, even if there's not anything happening in your community. This is not a one person job. So you need to recruit a um, supportive network. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is to approach it from a nonpartisan point of view. You know, all players are welcome. Um, and look to plug into already established groups. Like-minded groups might be at churches, book clubs, the PTA, other pro-democracy groups like the ACLU, Defense of Democracy, Red, Wine, and Blue, uh, People for the American Way, Stop Moms for Liberty. There's tons of them out there that you could uh, recruit to help you or you could become part of. Um, I happen, in my case, to reach out to parents who are already fans of the library, I have these groupies that were constantly <laughs> coming to visit Martha. So I alerted them immediately. And the, the student clubs at school specifically are gender and sexuality alliances. Um, I talked about Google alerts. Uh, and then participation is key, going to board meetings, whether it's your school board or your library board. And again, this is where working in numbers can help you. It is exhausting. I've gone to every board meeting of my school board for the last two years. It's exhausting. So if you're working with a larger coalition, you could create a sign up genius online, it's a free service, and spread the workload. So maybe every three months, you personally are going to a board meeting instead of every month. Uh, attend library programs at your public library, especially those that are for marginalized populations so that those attendance numbers are there. So the library understands they're important. And we all have a voice, use it. First thing you must do is report challenges when you become aware of them. Yesterday, I was on a um, uh, watching a webinar rather than participating with Becky's partner in uh, crime, good crime, Carolyn Foote, who said this memorable thing. A simple act of radical activism is reporting a book challenge to the American Library Association so we can document this moment in history as accurately as possible. Don't worry that somebody else has already done it. They'll figure that out at the ALA end. Make sure you report. Um, and when you're communicating about these issues to other people, when you're doing your advocacy, no lies, no exaggeration, be the trusted voice on the issue. The other side is going to be the one that tells the tall tales. You want to be perceived as the expert. Uh, and there are lots of platforms to help you. Every library, which is an amazing organization, has a platform called Fight for the First. So if you want to get a petition or a letter writing campaign going in your area, Fight for the First from every library will help you do it. It is totally free. Use the power of the pen. Letters to the editor still work. Write to school board members. Write to decision makers at the, the local library or in your school district. And it doesn't have to just be a letter of protest, but it can be a letter of appreciation. Thank you for making these diverse materials available in our library. Thank you for offering this program uh, for LGBTQ plus kids. And use all your social media platforms too uh, for the good to elevate those programs or to make others aware uh, of this important issue. And of course, last but not least, I don't need to tell you this. <laughs> it's a week late, but it still matters always. Vote for crying out loud. Uh, last week in our elections here in New Jersey, only about 26% of registered voters turned out. And that was even with the entire New Jersey legislature, Senate and Assembly was up for re-election. Only one out of four voters bothered to show up. And in some of our Board of Education races, those were decided by as little as three votes. Thank you. All of the concrete advice is really, really, really helpful. I'm gonna have to rewatch this and take notes and write, write it down, but I really, really appreciate that. And this should be recorded. I'm hoping to post it so you don't have to memorize all that. We can revisit, but Becky, what are your advice, pieces of advice for people? So I'm just going to kind of close the circle on this and just say that, you know, everything that both have shared is, is spot on. Um, I would also say never underestimate what your actions can do. Um, I am currently reading a book um, by Omkari L. Williams called Microactivism, 
how you can make a difference in the world without a bullhorn. And she speaks about what activism can look like and it's gonna look different for every person. So just like Datavian said, it's a step. You know, Martha shared different kinds of ways. Your your way might be through a letter writing campaign. You're, you might be just a great organizer person and you get the people to come in and maybe within that same group, there's somebody that's really great at finding the information or curating the talking points. And so together we build these coalitions at the grassroots level. And what all the research shows is that when our when we are networked at the grassroots level, positive things happen. You know, the other thing I would say too is, um, you know, move from action to awareness or from awareness to action, excuse me. And so I put in the chat a link that has, if you only have five minutes, you can do these things. If you have 10, 15 minutes, do this. If you have 30 minutes. And so those are really concrete things. I would also say join Unite Against Book Bans. Um, they don't spam you with a lot of email. They send targeted emails for when something's happening in your area so that people will activate and go speak up, um, whether it's email, in person, that sort of thing too. And, um, and then finally, just leveraging your circles of influence. We all know different people. And if I share within my social media circles about even just that action of like, I went to go vote, please be sure you go vote and take, and then you contact five people. We there's a ripple effect to that. So um, those things make a difference and there's documentation about that. So we can't forget about that. Well, thank you all. I have more questions, but I really wanna leave some time for the Q&A and I was gonna turn it over to Kat Goodshift to, to coordinate that Q&A. This is our instructional services librarian. Um, so if folks have questions, please put them in the Q&A section if you can. Um, and if, if they don't, I have more, <laughs> so. Sure, thanks, Emily. So far, we just had one question come through. It's from Anonymous. It says, um, Martha, you are a, a hero. Your determination and resilience are so amazing. Do you have advice for others facing these emotions? What has helped you keep going? Well, first, thank you, Anonymous, for believing that about me. I wish I believed it about myself with great regularity, but I don't. Um, and it is a, an emotional, intensely emotional experience. Um, the advice I have given to countless librarians over the last two years um, is that, and I think I mentioned it earlier, this is not a one person job. You cannot do it alone. Uh, that night when I was sitting in front of my television watching the live stream, I took this very cell phone, this one right here, while it was happening and started reaching out. So who did I reach out to? I reached out to my union. I'm fortunate to be represented by a union to let them know I was gonna need support. I reached out immediately in the moment to some of the organizations that Detavian mentioned earlier, National Coalition Against Censorship, PEN America, the American Library Association, Office for Intellectual Freedom, every library. Um, you know, They will get back to you in their time, some quicker than others, but they will be there to provide resources and most importantly, Importantly, I reached out to my library community. For those of you who are librarians watching, you know that we are members of a very wise and generous profession, and they really rallied to help me. Um, it was also very important for me, and it was a hard lesson to learn, uh, post-breakdown is when I learned the lesson, um, is self-care. In the month that led up to the breakdown, I was very much working with blinders on. I'm like, yeah, this is happening, but I'm just gonna keep doing the work, keep doing the work, keep doing the work. Uh, and eventually I wore myself out. So I have learned uh, since that time that I need to take care of myself. And for me, taking care of myself involves not staying at work until all hours of the evening, getting out of here at a reasonable time and going to do things that recharge my batteries. For me, that's some form of exercise. I love to swim. I get in the the pool and the cares of the day wash off of me. Um, sleep, I have a, I now have a sleep schedule. So, you know, I go to bed every night by about 8.30. I know that's crazy, but I'm up at five to get to school by 7.30. But maintaining that sleep schedule is helpful. And then this event is what finally prompted me to reach out to a therapist. I'll be 64 next week. I had never, before this happened, I had never ever 
um, engaged with a therapist. Why I waited so long, I don't know. It was incredibly valuable. It gave me new tools and skills. Um, so that was very useful too. Oh, and P.S. I have uh, the world's most wonderful husband wonderful husband his name is Doug Eaton I wanted to go on record the world's most wonderful and one of the things he gave me um, for Christmas that year that this happened was a subscription to oh no I'm going to forget the name of it because I'm a knucklehead big orange dot um, it's one of those mindfulness calming things and I, I use it all the time um, it just helps me go to sleep I gotta find the name of the big orange dot but those that's my advice to you I'll put the big orange dot in the chat <laughs> Thank you so much. We have had a few more questions come in. Um, the next question that we got is, Becky, what strategies do you use to keep your head above water? So just like Martha said, it's about balance. I also think we need to recognize that the times that we are going through right now are unprecedented. This is historical things that are happening right now. Yes, there's a history of book challenges, but never to the degree or depth of what we've seen. I mean, we've got very highly organized groups um, and their goal is to wear us out, right? So uh, we have to think of this as, um, a marathon and just as we would train for a marathon you know we know I, I've never been on a marathon so I'm just going to own that but my friend um, Carolyn uh, talks about you know we have to we have to think about this as a marathon so we have to be prepared for the length of time so that we can endure all that we have to do so that we can do this work um, so that means you know we're going to have to take breaks that uh, maybe we don't work alone and that we recognize when we need to recharge um, and find the things, do the things that bring us joy. Um, also, um, lean, know when, recognize when to lean on one another, um, to also just to get perspective, but to just, you know, have somebody to talk to. Um, this is, it's just hard work. Again, it's the right work, but, um, it takes a lot out of you. And so, um, finding those places to recharge or whether it's recharge physically and emotionally, but I think also, like coming together with fellow colleagues that share the same, that share um, and want and are doing the same work, coming together is 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 a great thing too. Um, and then finally, when I think about how hard this is, I also think about the why and that I do this work. There's, I love seeing um, our students step up. Um, we've got several band book clubs in the district, and I watched them start with students as sophomores, and now these students are seniors, and it has been incredible to watch them just step up and push back on the, on why it's important to have books these books accessible to them, um, and when I see what they do, and then not just them, but others. I've been interviewed by kids that are doing podcasts and I mean, I have so much hope um, because they, 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 these, these young adults are going to turn 18 and they're going to vote. And I know that they're going to help bring upon the, bring upon the change. Just like, you know, I see Detavion and, and, and Cameron. I mean, they're just, oh, I just, that gives me so much hope. So, um, so yeah. Thank you so much. The next question is for Detavian. It's also from Anonymous. What advice do you have for other students wanting to get involved or build a group? Okay, so I actually, I looked at the Q&A, so I kind of prepared something. Um, but I just want to touch back on, you know, what I said earlier, you know, finding your niche, finding your community and allowing that to be your advocacy, building upon your networks and your friends. And, you know, if you find, you know, people who are into this with you and they see what's going on, then you should totally be fine. But some like resources that I'll give, I'll say, um, because we do have to be concerted in our effort against them um, because, you know, they are very much concerted in their effort against us and like and against what we believe in and against young people being able to express themselves and read, honestly, which is quite astonishing because in Texas, literacy rates are in the toilet right now, but I digress. Um, but we have, <laughs> we have to be concerted in our efforts. So I will say 
the Kids' Right to Read Network um, by the National Coalition Against Censorship. It's a network that recently launched. Um, and it's, you know, it's a group of community grassroots organizers coming together and sharing resources, best practices and everything, you know, just to be that support net. And, you know, we can share resources if there's, you know, events coming up where you can get your group's name out there or something like that, anything like that. But just being in a supportive space and, you know, really putting yourself to your work and putting it where your heart and your mouth is, then you will totally be fine. Um, that's the only real suggestion I have when it comes to, you know, starting student groups. But, you know, if you're in a school setting, I'd suggest the SAS program, like what I started out with. That's really all I know to start out with because that's what's gotten me so far. Um, it was just me and a few other friends. And now we've expanded to, we're at two schools. We have over 400 members and it's just young people with a common mindset, you know, and a common goal. And we're just, we're going to achieve it. And like, I believe Becky or Martha said, you know, this work is tiring and you do have to take breaks and, you know, for yourself and rest. But, um, you know, being in a supportive safety net group and being in a brave space, honestly, that kind of, it remedies that situation. Because when you're, you know, feeling down and, you know, you're feeling like you can't continue this work, you have your support system to rely on and lean back on, honestly. And it's really a motivational tool, asset. Um, but yeah, that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. I hope you stay motivated and energized and engaged for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you and your network. Um, there's one more question. Uh, we have two minutes left. So maybe, and this is kind of general um, and it's about messaging. So maybe um, all three of you could, you know, give this your 30 second answer. How do you address the argument? This is from Elizabeth. How do you address the argument that the books contain quote pornographic material? How do you reclaim the narrative when they're arguing they're not against books, they're against pornography? Um, if I can go really fast, I have to say, um, probably use what the Supreme Court does. Um, if they say it's an issue, use the militarist. That's been used in Supreme Court cases before. And, you know, if it has actual societal value, then they can't really claim that it's pornographic in a way. And the word like words like inappropriate are also like it's legalese. There's no really legal precedent for what inappropriate really means. So it's just language that they use, but it holds no legal, legal meaning. It's just a scare tactic. I put yeah. in the chat um, an infographic that I have used successfully, which is, all right, Miller test, excellent. Uh, and then let's also use this thing that isn't around much, logic. How do books actually enter a school library? And that's what my infographic shows you uh, just very quickly in a school library. We have selection criteria we must follow. Then, you know, we're reading hundreds of reviews every month. We don't have an unlimited budget. So we're pulling only the best books that match our student interests and our curriculum. Our recommendations then go through multiple levels of administrative review until it reaches a superintendent who signs off on that purchase uh, order, which goes then to what? a uh, state approved school library book distributor. School library book distributors make their money by selling books to schools. They don't wanna lose their, uh, their revenue stream by selling pornography that's gonna put them out of business. It makes no sense. We couldn't put pornography on a school library shelf if we wanted to. The infographic will help you with that. Yeah, yeah, no, no one would intentionally sell pornography. And so that is a word to um, to inflame the conversation. So I think we have to talk about age relevant books for readers. Um, and we also have to remember that they're using that term to create fear. And so we just need to keep that in mind. And, and push back, I think, is the big thing because we know that, I mean, only a judge can determine if something's pornographic anyway. Um, and like Natavian said and Martha said, um, if we're following the Miller test, we have to read the book as a whole and make a determination. But when they flash a page and say, call it this, I mean, yeah, it could, it's, it's being misrepresented. 
Well, we're a minute past three. I feel like I could listen to the three of you talk all day. I'm a little sad that it's over, but I just the biggest thank you for this and for all the work that you do. And I know it's so appreciated. Thank you for coordinating this. It was great. Oh. Yeah, it was fun.